Hi, I'm Duwe Wep Frazier, and you're listening to episode 26 of Nerdocity Podcast. Today, my guest is Taimba Jess. He is an award winning poet and author of two books of poetry, Lead Belly and Olio. Olio won the 2017 Pulitzer Prize, the Annisfield Wolf Book Award, the Midland Society Authors Award in Poetry, and received an outstanding contribution to publishing citation from the Black Caucus of the American Library Association. It was also nominated for the National Book Critics Circle Award, the Penn Jean Stein Book Award, the Kingsley Tufts Poetry Award. Lead Belly was a winner of the 2005 National Poetry Series. The Library Journal and Black Issues Book Review both named it one of the best poetry books of 2005. Jess Akave Khanum and New York University alumni received a 2004 Literature Fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts and was a 2004 to 2005 Winter Fellow at the Provincetown Fine Arts Work Center. Jess is also a veteran of the 2000 and 2001 Green Mill Poetry Slam Team and won a 2000 to 2001 Illinois Arts Council Fellowship in Poetry the 2001 Chicago Sun-Times Poetry Award, and a 2006 Whiting Fellowship. He presented his poetry at the 2011 TEDx Nashville Conference and won a 2016 Lannan Literary Award in Poetry. Jess received a Guggenheim Fellowship in 2018. He is a professor of English, a distinguished professor of English at College of Staten Island. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Tayamba. Greetings. Good How to be here. How are you doing? Here. I'm doing really well. How are you doing? Good. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. And let me just tell you, this is truly, truly um, a privilege. First off, all of your accolades and your, your notoriety as a poet, but today is the last day of National Poetry Month. Wow. Okay. I yeah, wish that's I had right. the, um, the applause uh, sound, <laughs> sound bite. <laughs> that would... Right. We'll just clap it ourselves. Yes. Right? <laughs> so much for poetry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I just think it's cool um, having it you is. here on the last month, uh, the last day of the, the Poetry Month here. So. Glad to help you close it out. Thanks so much. All right. So, Lead Belly and Olio, your two monumental books of poetry that have received so many um, accolades and awards. So, I just wanted to kind of go over that and just, you know, what that was like for you to um, be writing and see the validation of, uh, you know, the poetry community, the literary world in recognizing your, your talent and gift. Um, so specifically, I'm speaking of your uh, Pulitzer Prize in 2017. Congratulations on that. Um, the Annisfield Wolf Book Award, the Midland Society Authors Award in Poetry, um, a publishing citation from the Black Caucus of the American Library Association, um, you've received a uh, nomination for the National Book Critics Circle Award, the Penn Jean Stein Book Award, the Kingsley Tufts Poetry Award. And of course, Lead Belly was a winner of the 2004 National Poetry Series and so many more. Um, I just think you are phenomenal. And so please let's hear about what this journey has been like for you. Wow, uh, you know, I think that um, it, it's it's when you put it like that, it's a uh, it's a lot different from the actual journey. You know, I mean, the the actual journey is word by word, line by line, stanza by stanza, you know, section by section, uh, <laughs> and it's um, it's really about. I mean, the funny thing about uh, trying trying to write is you have to forget about all of these these accolades and whatnot, and you have to just really think about the subject at hand and how to best serve the subject at hand and how to 
bring it in a new and in and a new way that's interesting to both to you primarily and hopefully to uh the reader and to find some kind of sense of discovery in what you're writing so um to come out at the end of that process first off i mean you know to come out at the end of the process and have a book published is um is a major uh major goal. Right, but let's, let's take strip it back a little. Coming out with with a poem that one is satisfied with hmm. is a major goal. Uh, that's number one. And then coming out with a book that one is it can live with is hmm. uh, is another major major goal. Um, and having other people read it and appreciate it is. Uh, is extremely gratifying and then to to receive recognition on top of that is is humbling so, so many uh other poets that um that are so you know have have led me in so many ways and uh have not received that same kind of recognition so it's humbling and it's and it's it's uh it makes you come back to the page, hopefully in a in a in a new way every time, in a new, more determined way every time. Wow, you know that leads me to wonder: Do you believe that um, everyone has their time in the sun? In other words, you know there may be other poets, but when it's your time, it's your time. Well, I think what I what I believe is that. Um, you you have to make your own time. What I was saying is that you have to make your own time. In other words, you have to be, you have to, I think the best way to approach this as, is as if you are writing for yourself and you're, you're writing to write the best thing that you know how to write. And that, that primarily is the reward and not to count on any other awards beyond that, other than having finished the thing that you want to write. Because if you start thinking about this award and that award and so-and-so reading it and such and such reading it and this review and that review, then you're gonna wipe yourself out and it's gonna, it's gonna detract from the, the honesty of the thing that you're trying to write. And, wow. And that, that's, that's really just critical to um, writing something that's, 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 you know, a value to you and eventually a value to the world. So it's a little bit of a, it's a little bit of a catch 22, so to speak. Truly, you know, I once had someone um, I was meeting with uh, probably a more senior uh, a senior, not probably a senior uh, writer, someone who's also a professor, and they were, they were asking me about my path, and they were like, you know, you don't seem to be concerned with any awards or anything like that. And I was like, oh, was I supposed to be? I guess I don't know. And then they basically talked to me about the fact that a lot of poets and writers are very much, you know, cognizant of that. Like there are people that are creating and thinking about, you know, those awards and accolades. And I remember, you know, back in the day, that was just something that I wasn't, you know, qu quite aware of. And I realized it's, a, it's just a whole mindset um, to, mm. you know, think about those things. Um, so I appreciate you mentioning that, okay, I'm not gonna, you know, like create to get the accolades. It's nice, but you right. can't, you know, be obsessed about that. Right, you know, I mean, it, 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 I, I'm not saying, that Ain't, nobody doesn't want accolades. I mean, I don't. I don't think. I don't think to be honest, nobody. There's, there's nobody out there that that issues, you know, accolades. I mean, there are some people that not, that don't don't want them. Period. But you can't you can't let that 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 drive your writing. You can't you can't be the thing that that you're in it for. Because if you're in it for like for that, then you're gonna you're really just gonna you're cruising for a bruise and you're gonna break your heart and a lot of other and you're gonna be unhappy. So, you know, just just celebrate the
the the idea of coming to the page and bringing the best that you a actually have to offer. I mean, that means, in my opinion, you know, you know, how they say leave nothing on the field, just like, yeah, just go all out and do the absolute best that you can and bring a and, and treat it like that so that when you leave that poem or you put that poem out in the world you're you're really that's because that's really what we're saying when we when we're publishing something we're saying this is the best that i could do at this time yes. <laughs> you know and i might be i'm going to be in a different place for a month from now but at this point this is the best that i can do here it is thank you goodbye Mm. <laughs> you know right there it is yeah. take it or leave it <laughs> mm -hmm. so I'd like to ask you about lead belly um, so we know that lead belly examined the life and times of the legendary blues musician from a variety of intimate and historical perspectives mm -hmm. and you used a variety of innovative poetic forms in your collection um, I wanted to ask you what your inspiration was for the book, even if you briefly want to touch on that. And if you think you, that there are other um, musicians, certainly uh, notable artists who you would consider um, writing another um, biography and poems about. You know, there, there are so many po uh, musicians out there that are worthy of uh, that kind of uh, biography, you know what I mean? Or that kind of attention in verse, you know, they, I mean, <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of stories. There were stories in, in, in writing Lead Belly that, you know, like for instance, Blind Lemon Jefferson, he was, you know, fascinating character. He, he could have write a whole book about Blind Lemon Jefferson. Mm -hmm. There's a whole, there's another guy, you know, in that book that, <laughs> that uh, that should have got a poem of his own, you know, uh, Tangle Eye, uh -huh. who was another who was another uh, prisoner on Parchment Farm. That could have been a whole another book in itself. But you know, there's all kinds of you know, the thing about history that, that I find interesting is, and this is no disparagement of fiction or fiction writers, but <laughs> there is a saying: Who needs fiction when you have you know reality? <laughs> and there's so many. <laughs> There's so many amazing stories in in history that uh, that are just out there, just waiting to be told. And I would say, particularly in African American history, that just are are waiting to be told in in so many in so many different ways. That um, uh, it's uh, it's really it, it's. I mean, the fascinating thing is is stumbling upon a story that that haven't that hasn't been told yet and right. being able to like grasp a hold of it and, and understand it and understand its relationship to the present. And that's really what was uh, going on in Lead Belly is seeing a man who was uh, struggling with a few different things. You know, one was his artistic uh, capabilities and the other one was his, um, was himself. And his grasp over anger, his grasp over self-control, and in many ways, um, I was dealing with some of those issues in my own life. And so, what you're saying in in Lead Belly is is that is is my struggle with with discipline and control being voiced through an a an, an, uh, retelling of his story, so to speak. Wow. Yeah. And so in, in, and so in thinking about Lead Belly, does that mean you felt that his life was reflective of yours? Uh, you know, in certain ways, uh, yes. I mean, it's not like I went to prison and killed, killed a guy and, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and all that. But right. I think that being, being a black male artist in America, uh, dealing with, you know, uh, personal demons and whatever they may be, you know, you know, lack of discipline or, 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 or a uh, struggling with the, with the capacity to make one's art, master one's art, art and make that art work for oneself and create a living out of that art. 
I think that was those those are similarities that we definitely have have in common that stretch across the decades. Um, you know, and I will say this: that when I started writing that book, I was in a very, very, very bad situation oh, in a wow. remote town in uh, <laughs> where I was uh, dealing with some very difficult issues in life. Yeah. And uh, the first poem I wrote in that book was that poem where he is, uh, where Lead Belly had escaped from prison and they set the, he's running, running away from prison and they set the dogs after him. Mm -hmm. And he, this dog goes into the Red River and he drowns the dog. Mm. And so the, uh, and so the, the sheriff is across the, on the bank deciding whether or not to shoot him or to and shoot him dead or take him in. Right. So that was, you know, that was, that was pretty much akin to the way I was feeling at the Whoa. time, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, it's, it's like, it's, it's writing, it's, it's writing in with a, with an understanding of somebody else's historical plight, but also, you know, it's unavoidable to have your own persona in there as well as you're writing somebody else's persona poem. You know, so true. Wow, I'm really struck by that. Hmm. Um, yeah. You know, I also you 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 answered a question I was going to ask you. Um, it makes me think about you know who when we when we talk about so many artists who should have their biographies written, you know, whether in poetic form or other mm -hmm. form formats. Um, you know, I thought about uh, someone I have an interest in, and then I found some things about their life and was like, would it be acceptable if this person is not, you know, okay, picture perfect? Like you mentioned, Lead Belly yeah. had gone to prison. Yeah. Um, maybe unjustly so, but what if a person actually did do something really bad in their life, but yet they are so talented and such a genius. And it's like, mm -hmm. wow, this subject would be great for a book. That's a really good question. Cause, cause frankly, um, I can't say that, you know, I don't even think lead belly would say that he was unjustly sent to prison. He really did shoot a guy in the head okay, and, and killed him over. But was it self-defense? No. Well, I don't know. I don't know to what degree it was self-defense, but the second time he was drunk and he got, got in a fight with somebody over a song and stabbed him 16 times. Whoa. Okay. So I, you know, so it's like one of those was probably at least one. Like, yeah. At least one of them was, you know, <laughs> it's like, they should have yeah, him in. <laughs> yeah. You know, maybe you should have a timeout, you know what I'm right. saying? Okay. <laughs> so, but, but I, but I think that, but I would say also, you know, there's other issues that came up with Lead Belly, and you know, he was, he was abusive to some women in his life. And, you know, and you see, know. that's what I'm talking about. Like, you got mm -hmm. somebody you really kind of look up to, and then you do some mm -hmm. digging and some investigating, mm -hmm. and you find some things, and maybe not that. It could have been something else. It could have been, mm -hmm. uh, just something totally so bizarre. And then you look deeper, and it's like, huh, was the person framed? Did they really do this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, you know, yeah. So. that's that's a really good, you know, that's a really good ethical question hmm. uh, that one has to deal with. And, and when you're dealing with all of these issues, you know, you're dealing with the complexity of human nature. You know, I mean, right. Uh, I, I think I think there are issues that are worth investigating. You know, it depends on, it, you know, it depends on, on what you're how how deeply you're going into somebody's life. But, you know, the question. The yeah, like becomes... if you wanted it to be a children's book. I mean, this is what I'm huh, saying. Right, right. Like, you, right, you know, right. hey, a great children's picture book, biography, mm. you know, about because it's not a subject that has been out. I mean, we know there's so many. It, it's almost like the same uh, Black subjects sometimes seem to be recycled. And, and I'm speaking more of children's literature, but, mm. uh, but I asked you that knowing, okay, well, here's someone a, a talented artist that you did your your work your biographical work on and it's like okay so 
would it be appropriate to do Lead Belly <laughs> as a children's book? You know, to introduce that's his good, talent. That's a good question because, you know, I think I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure he used to do uh, a lot of songs that were sung by children. And I know for a fact that, well, that um, he used to, he used to live, um, uh, I can't remember the name of the, the park that I think he used to live near Morningside Park. Oh, wow. In, um, in, uh, in Harlem? In, 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 uh, well, do people consider that Harlem? That's New York City. Yeah, I don't think no. it's, it's not, not, it's not, not there. Not, but, yeah. but he, when he would walk through the park, the kids would run up to him and, ha and he would ha take out his guitar and play for him. Hmm. No, but I mean, he, in reality, I mean, he was, he did murder somebody. Someone, right. You know? Okay. And, and, and he brutally injured another person, but that doesn't mean that that's the, the totality of their, of their story. And really, you know, part, so I think that part of what, you know, I think that's part of what poetry can do is, and really literature can do is, is to bring us complex understandings of ourselves. Mm -hmm. now, now, children's literature, I mean, as, as you put it in that context, that's, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if that would be uh, something sure. that I would put in a children's children's book. I mean, not that but, you would put that part of their life, but can mm -hmm. you, I mean, hey, can you focus on a, a, a person who was so accomplished with, mm -hmm. with the guitar, with their voice, but yet, you know, that, that, I guess that's all I'm saying, but yet you find out Hey, they were not perfect. Yeah, well, who was though? Yeah, you know, but who, some people's stuff doesn't get found out. I mean, I'm talking about <laughs> like it's right. been publicized. <laughs> right, right. Well, I mean, you know, uh, that that's that's a good that's a good question. Um, probably in in children's literature, it's not something that that one would bring up. But I think that in in young adult literature, it's definitely uh, possible. You know, sure. I mean. I think it's definitely possible in, in, uh, in I mean, it's, I think it's kind of critical in, in other literature. Sure. But, you know, it, it's, I think that, um, you know, that's, that's a really, really good question. And I think that what, that's one of the, one of the ethical issues that we have to address, even, even in adult poetry or in, in general poetry is like, you know, how complex are you going to make these people that really did really negative things? Yes. Like, for instance, I mean, you know, even even Alan Lomax, mm -hmm. or I say I should say uh, John Lomax, who was mm -hmm. uh, really a, a kind of a cross between a professor and a hustler mm. and <laughs> a, and a, a music ethnomusicologist, mm -hmm. a pioneer in that field. And um, uh, and a racist, mm. right? I mean, mm -hmm. on the other hand, without him uh, going across country with this with this ex convict in his car collecting songs mm -hmm. from uh, from people in prison farms and uh, and then and on uh, plantations across the south, which is what he did with Lead mm. Belly. Mm. I don't even know who Lead Belly was. That's just the reality. Wow. You know, so, I mean, how do you frame, you know, uh, um, how do you frame John How Lomax? do you frame imperfection? Right. There. Right. There mm -hmm. it is. Because, you know, even, you know, it, it does make you think about, you know, there are things that would be, let's say, acceptable in or, or, how should I say this? Uh, there are things that we would do 30 years ago or, or, or terms we would use 30 years ago mm -hmm. that would be unacceptable today. It's true. You know, mm -hmm. and, and, and it takes, you know, you have to, you know, it's, it's, the question is how do you interrogate that, that change? How do you, how do you engage that kind of uh, change in understanding. Sure. Without yeah. saying that you agree with right. those things, but yet, I mean, you know, it's a part of our history. And just like mm -hmm. I'm mentioning, you know, I often hear we don't have enough focus on some of our uh, very talented genius uh, Black folks, uh, many of whom have passed on by this time. 
and who were complex and who live complex lives and who were impacted by racism and, mm-hmm. and so many other things. And perhaps that was a part of why they, you know, may have gotten into some of the more negative aspects of their lives that they did. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess in thinking about Lead Belly and what you did with your, your work, uh, it just makes me think about that and, and some questions that I've had for a while about biographical content and, you know, what's, what's, what's good to, what's good to reveal and what's not. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I will say that, you know, when I, I mean, when I found out about Lead Belly's, you know, violent relationships with women. Uh, I had to ask myself whether or not to write about about them. And I decided yeah. to, you know, have some poems in the book about that because I felt that it would uh I need to, they needed to, you know, testify to that to that aspect of his personality. Mm-hmm. Um Did you judge him even while you were doing this? Did you find yourself judging him? Did you feel sorry for him? Did you feel you know, what was that relationship as you're going through this? You know, I would say that it was, it was a little bit like, um, I mean, that, well, that book took five years to write. Mm. And during the time that I wrote it, I, I basically looked up every single possible thing that I could about Lead Belly. And this was in like, say, 90, what, 99 to 2004. Mm-hmm. So there were not as many electronic resources as there are now. You had to go to libraries and, you know, all that, all that stuff. I visited his grave. Wow. Um, I went to, uh, I went to um, uh, the Lomax, uh, the depository of Lomax's uh, uh, files mm-hmm. in uh, University of Texas, Austin. I went to the Smithsonian, you know, I mean, and I did that. I, I was, I was, pretty much obsessed with finding anything and everything that was written about him. So it became a little bit like being in conversation with him. You mm. know what I mean? It became a little bit, bit understanding all the places that he was, you know, developing a timeline of his life, um, just constantly being involved in, in, in trying to understand his life and, and, and having uh, genuine admiration and respect for his uh, his talent, but at the same time, understanding that you know he had a you know you he, you didn't want to make him mad under, under certain circumstances. Definitely you know? didn't want to make him yeah. mad, <laughs> right? You know, he did, and, and he had a violent he had a violent temper, and, and he was he was he did egregious things. But yeah. that but but it 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 just meant like it means like you, you come in conversation with this person when you're writing it. You, uh, in my the way I approach it is like you know I mean I'm I'm thinking you know okay lead you know you did this this thing was was terrible that you did right. but I have to write about it because it's a part part of the totality of who you were mm-hmm. who you are you know mm-hmm. and this year you did something that's that's amazing and I'm gonna write about that as well mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. here you did something that that it that that compromised your ethics or you were you were you were playing a role in order to get something out of your out of somebody else mm-hmm. but that's let's see what that looks like you know what i'm saying and so it's it really is about being in, in conversation with him and 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 having in developing that kind of relationship so to speak over time well you know, I really appreciate um, you going back, you know, in your mind and reflecting about that. I mean, mm, yeah, really, 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 really deep, really meaningful. So um, that brings us to Olio. Yeah. Tayemba. So, mm-hmm. you know, you seem to continue on with the with a focus on blues. Uh, mm-hmm. as well as work songs and church hymns, and mm-hmm. again, focusing on African-American uh, performers. Mm-hmm. Uh, did Lead Belly lead you to this work, or was this work a standalone? This is something you were planning or was just in your mind for a while? Um, 
Well, Lead Le Belly did lead me to, to the people in, in Olio because the question became, well, who influenced Lead Belly? Who were the people that were making music that influenced Lead Belly, for one? And for two, um, what were their lives like? Um, how did they survive? Um, and essentially, what was the, what was, what's a glimpse of the history of Black music before the era of recording? Because most of the people in the book were not, there was only one of which there are actual audio recordings, and that's Burt Williams. And hmm. the rest of them, there are no recordings. There's, there's transcripts of, of their compositions in certain cases, but there's no recordings. So um, that became uh, the, the impetus for, for Olio. I see. And, you know, you, you talked about Lead Belly being uh, a work that you started and finished, and it took several years. Was that the mm -hmm. same time frame for this, uh, for Olio as well? Yeah, Olio was about seven and a half years, more or less. Uh, it was about, it was about three, three and a half years of, of, of sitting in bewilderment after, after Lead Belly wow. was published. And then it was about seven and a half years of, of uh, hitting it hard with Olio. Yeah. yeah. Just, you know, trying everything I could uh, f to make Olio happen. Yeah. And in that time, that meant, you know, researching and then writing and researching and writing and, you know, going back and forth between, you know, history books and recordings and transcripts and the page and then back and forth and back and forth, you know, over and over and over again. Wow. And this is what they mean when they say you can't rush a book. Yeah, um, it's, I, I, got, I got lucky in certain ways in, in, in that I, uh, I, uh, I kind of allowed myself to stretch out in time mm -hmm. and, and uh, and make and and make the time to uh, to let Olio come to come to fruition. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense because uh, your publication date or or year for Lead Belly was two thousand five and, and five, uh, and then for your uh, second work, Olio, it was uh, twenty sixteen. Yep, that's a long story. That's a long stretch. <laughs> so, yeah, so, it's a long time um, to lay out. Yep. Right, but you know that means it was just so much more. You know, so much more profound. And as we started the interview, I was asking you about your your awards and and accolades, and it's like you know, so you had it cooking for several years, and it's like it, it's almost like you know, the more time you put into it, the care, the research, uh, the reflection, the you know, really absorbing uh, what you were studying so that you could write and, and piece it all together. It's like, wow, you know, it, it almost seems like there's a greater reward in stretching it out that way. Yeah, I would say that um, that it, there's certain ways that book kind of snuck up on me. I mean, I didn't intend it to be 220 odd pages. I didn't intend it to take the dimensions that it took. I did, you know, but um, it just kind of developed that way. Mm -hmm. um, and I, re I, I was also intent on making it one book instead of several books or two books. Uh, and, um, and it wasn't until about five years in that I even understood what the layout of the book was really going to look like. Wow. And, uh, but I was really focused on what the poems would look like, what they would say, who were the people that were going to be in the book. Mm -hmm. And that, those were my primary concerns. And what were the kind of motifs of the book that I was going to follow? Sure. And this book does have uh, illustration in it, right? Olio yes. or some sketches. Yes. And did yes. you do those? No, those are by, by uh, Jessica Lynn Brown, who's a fascinating uh, character. I found, uh, I found out about her because my good friend, Joel Dias Porter, 
also known as DJ Renegade. Oh, yeah, I know DJ Renegade. Yeah. <laughs> he, he, he hit me to her because he, he sent me something, uh, uh, a, a text or something saying, yo, man, you got to check this, this sister out. <laughs> he sent me a video of her. So uh, basically in Olio, there's several poems that are called contrapuntal poems mm-hmm. in which there's uh, two voices uh, on separate sides of the poem, which when, that which tell different stories, but when read across the poem, tell one unified story. Uh, so there's several poems like that, contrapuntal. So they're multi multi voice poems. And what Jessica Lynn Brown is able to do is to write with both hands simultaneously in opposite directions. Whoa. Yeah. So, so what her, is that called? Is that like a... I don't know what that's called. It's, it's, it's I mean, there must be some kind so she's of... she's both left-handed and right-handed. And right-handed. If you dictate something to her, she can write it with both hands going in opposite directions at the same time. Good fascinating. Lord. Yeah, fascinating. Uh, mm. She's here. got and, some brain. Is she a yeah. published writer as well? Well, she's a she's a graphic artist and, uh-huh. and she's she does she's multi genre. Uh, so mm-hmm. uh so so I was like I she he he ran me this this video for her. I was like, oh, I have to be in touch with this person. Mm-hmm. You know, because we're working on the same level in some kind of way. And uh, and then I saw, you know, I got in touch with her. Hey, how you doing? Et cetera, da, da, da. And then, um, and then uh, she, I saw her drawings. And her drawings are these stark, um, charged uh, kind of uh, line drawings that are that that are have a kind of uh, raw energy to them, mm-hmm. and they just were—they're captivating images. So, you know, I had finished—I had finished most of Olio, and really, frankly, it was like ninety-five percent done. And it, it occurred to me, like, you know what? We should—we should have some of her drawings in the book, which I had wow. never really intended to do. So that was your suggestion. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. And um I contacted her and then we you know we drew up you know she did we we collaborated I would tell her what I was looking for for each section. So there's a drawing of hers at the beginning of every section of the book which in my opinion you know I hadn't really thought that there would be drawings in the book but what I think her drawings do is is well, they give the reader a place to pause in the midst of all the words and the ideas that are going on in the book. And that's number one. They separate the chapters. Number three, they, they, they add a kind of, uh, of a kind of taught, a kind of stark vision to, in a, in a different understanding to the characters in the book. And uh, they they lifted in a in a way that I had that I had not really anticipated, and they 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 kind of refresh the the reader, the, if, you know, in my mm-hmm. from my experience, because I'm it's hard for me to see because I'm so close up on it, mm-hmm. but they they refresh the experience for the reader. So, wow. Um, and so the hard part was you know convincing the publisher to really to go to put these drawings in at the last minute. Which you know, that's another thing. Uh, my publisher is Wave Books. Yeah, they published uh, Lead Belly, uh, and then, and then you know, that's that was another kind of stroke of luck for me. In I'm that. telling you, I saw that that you had both of your books with yeah. the same publisher, even you know, with the great amount of time between the two of them. Right. Um, I thought was really uh, amazing. Well, you know. Um, uh, the folks at, at, at Wave, they're bibliophiles. Mm. You know? They they love the technology of the book. 
And that became part of the argument for the book or part of the thesis of the book is that here's some, here's old technology that can stand up against the new technology. Wow. And, and they, you know, the book is, like I said, it's, it's 220 odd pages. It's eight and a half by 11 in, uh, in, uh, in stature. Mm -hmm. And it's got four fold out pages that tear out of the book very neatly, I might add. Wow. And that, just doing that alone, having that level of dedication to the uh, look and feel of the book was, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, I, don't, I don't know of any other press that would dedicate that kind of, that kind of expertise and time and energy to, uh, to the book, to, to, to hardly any of their books. But Wave is consistent like that. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. I'm really happy to hear that. You had a really great experience or are, are having a, yeah. a great experience with them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. And so, um, so how are you, or how are you feeling? Are we good to go on a little bit? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, great. And so, um, Taimba, I really wanted to ask you, you know, we've been uh, in the midst of this pandemic for over a year now. Um, you know, I wondered if the pandemic has impacted your creativity at all, uh, either way, in that you're really creating really, really, um, you know, on a schedule or, you know, there are other things going on that the pandemic has produced for you. Wow. You know, um, I, I'm going to be real with you and say that it has been very hard. During, it, during this pandemic, there's been yeah. a lot of things going on with me uh, and uh, a lot of changes. Um, I've been uh, uh, pretty involved in, uh, uh, for one, in Cave Canem, which is, I should say, I need to say, take some time during this interview and say that, frankly, none of what I'm doing right now would really be possible without Cave. Conum, wow, which is yes. C A V E C A N E M, two separate words. And it's, it's not uh, cave, it's not cave, cave. No, it's not. It's, it's not. <laughs> it's cave conum. It means in Latin, it means beware the dog. Uh, yes. the, but it's, uh, it's an organization, a fellowship of black poets that started in uh, 1996, uh, which is it, essentially consisting of black poets from around the country gathering together to share their work together and workshop their work and and just share their their critiques with each other uh and it's been going on for 25 years as of now and it uh it's it's without kind of vision of uh, Toy Derricotte and Cornelius Eady gathering poets uh, without any allegiance to any particular aesthetic, mm. I think, which is critical. Um, uh, just being, just with, with allegiance only to honesty and absolute um, uh, pursuit of the best that one can do, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, with, with that kind of uh, framework and that kind of fellowship of, of, uh, of poets I could uh, reach out to and grow with, uh, I, don't, I, I, just, I, I would not have uh, been able to accomplish what I have accomplished today, so. Uh, I want to say that that has been a, a critical part of my development and education. Uh, wow. And I, now I've been heavily involved with the organization. I, I'm now president of the board of directors. Oh, you're president of the board. Congratulations. Yeah, that, that's a, a new development. Thank you. And, and it's, uh, it's an honor to be uh, of service in that way to this amazing fellowship that now has uh, roughly 400 fellows wow. uh, across the country and around the world writing poems and 
so many different ways and and being creative in so many different facets and and genres that uh you know it's 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 amazing it's that's been at the core of changing the face of American literature. So Yes, indeed. And, you know, that is how I met you. I met you at one of the events uh, many, many years ago uh, as I was, you know, around uh, the folks uh, in the organization. And uh, just I've always heard the wonderful stories about um, the love and support that poets have received uh, through Kave Kanam in, in the uh, the summer fellowships, uh, right? There's a, an annual uh, a summer retreat. Mm-hmm. Yes. And, um, you know, I always heard, heard the wonderful stories about that. And myself, I've taken several of the, of the regional workshops. And so I, I, I know firsthand um, just a lot of the genius um, that, that you get from um, really interacting and learning from uh, the poets in this organization. Yeah, yeah, it's been, it's been um, a phenomenal, really, you know, I'm my, I, 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 when you look at the impact of uh, Kave Kanem, and this is going to sound, this is going to sound, I don't know how this is going to sound. To don't people, worry but, about it. This is but your, I was your say story. <laughs> that the, really, the only thing to compare it to is the Harlem Renaissance. Oh, wow. That's In amazing. It's a movement. Impact. Yeah. It's a movement. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because there is no other body or institution I can think of. Well, there's Furious Flower that I really right. think of as being in the family with uh, with oh, yeah. Khan, I'm kind of working hand mm-hmm. in hand. Hurst and Wright Foundation. Yes. They've also been active. They've, Hurst and Wright has been around with, for 30 years now. For a yeah. long time. Mm-hmm. Um, then there's there's some uh, some very you know critical journals. I mean, I'm not, I, I can't mention all of them, but I will say Obsidian Literary. Oh Arts. yes. Mm-hmm. It's been around. Callaloo has been around for. Uh, you know, now. Sure. Um, and and there's new organizations like the Watering Hole mm-hmm. that uh, that's been uh, all these organizations and and Vona right and Vona yes Vona mm-hmm. has been uh, all of these organizations not not could even you know stretching it beyond you know the you know uh, black literary organizations I'd say Kundaman mm-hmm. has been a, a critical uh, organization Canto Mundo has been organization. All these organizations have really, really changed, you know, the face of American literature dramatically. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm really, I feel, I feel blessed <laughs> to at a time when these organizations are, these fellowships uh, I, I have been developing and are still thriving. Yeah. Yes, indeed. It's so wonderful to hear that history. And I'm, I really appreciate how you linked all those different um, organizations, because we might think, oh, there's only been a few. But no, there's there's no. really been throughout time, as you mentioned. Mm-hmm. Um, it kind of feels like, you know, each one has really um, lent it to developing and fostering that that whatever that generation of writer and poet was, you know, the ones mm-hmm. that were coming up. Um, there's been, you know, that support there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. And so, and so Tayemba, if I may ask, you know, what do you feel with the pandemic and everything going on? I won't even who go into just the news and all the mess that's been going right. on the past, you know, year and even more, of course, since Michael Brown and even before that, but, you know, what do you feel is the poet's responsibility uh, at this time, if there is a particular role uh, or focus that that one can have uh, in centering uh, amidst of the various, um, you know, tragedies we've seen, injustices, uh, Mm. politics, you name it. Um, does the poet have a particular role at this time? 
You know, I, I would say that I, I would not want to use the word responsibility. And I only say yeah. that because it's been my experience, <laughs> especially with poets, uh, that when you tell them that they have to do something, they're definitely not going to do it. <laughs> definitely not going to do it. You know? And, and, you know, but I, I would rather frame it as a kind of, as, as what I see as opportunity. Mm. And opportunity to um opportunity to explore our history and and gain understandings from that history or these these histories that have been so neglected and so so uh derided and 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 erased and and glean knowledge from these histories and bring them to the to the page in new exciting interesting engaging ways that's one that's one opportunity that i see because i think you know you know for me you know learning learning through these histories has been uh critical to our to my understanding of uh of the present and possible futures you know um so I mean, and uh, the other thing is, is there's so many, you know, opportunities to further understand um, to further understand the complexity of our humanity. You know, to mm -hmm. further to further explore um, the the ways that we. Uh, the ways that we are complicated, you know, uh, racially, you know, sexually, um, identity-wise, um, in so many different ways that, uh, you know, all of that de deserves rich and energetic and empathetic uh, exploration. Well, yes, indeed. And, you know, that brings me to asking, do you have a few poems that you'd like to share? Yeah, why not? Why not? You know what? Um, why, don't I, um, why don't I read that poem that I was uh, talking about from, from Lead Belly? Yes. If I, if I can find it right quick. Because okay. this was the, the very, let me, let me find that, that, that joint right quick. <laughs> This is the very first one that I that I read that I wrote for for lead and it was uh and, and yeah. what's the title of it? It's uh Runagate. Yeah. Runagate. I I even remember where I was when I wrote this this one. You do. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> Uh, I mean, that's a whole nother me? interview. That's a whole nother interview. Oh, that's a whole nother interview. Okay, part two. <laughs> right, right. Okay. But Lead Belly, Runagate. Where water and land meet is shore. And on shore is iron in fists of jailers and sun of Texas swamp. I wade into bubble and blue ink of red river, my head a shaving, bobbing brown island of shine. A warden's finger etches the balance of my life on the trigger, weighs up the finance of lead versus nigger labor, as he yells one last time for my life. And here we all are, stuck in this crossroads, hard as the bullet I hammered into a man's heart in Bowie County. Let the hound come, old rattler, ripping jaws into my flesh, while I wade this Brazos baptism of blood and water. I know it's over. There will be no more chase today, and so what do I have left between this hellhound's jaws and freedom's crucifixion in the hell of Sugarland? I let the canine neck snap under my sickle of fingers, my blessing, this sacrament of water. I want to let the water take me, I want to surrender to this river's rock and swirl, come up clean and white as death itself. But the black in me breaks down into blues. And now I feel the coffle of their claws. I am stepping toward dry land, the dance of ankle chains, where I scream history into song that works itself into blood, sweat, memory. Wow. 
Wow. That's like a short film. I mean, the imagery in that is like, ooh, it, it really it really hits you. Thank you. Thanks. Yep. Mm-hmm. That was Lead Belly. And, wow. Um, I guess I'll read, uh, how about one from Olio? Yes. These, story, these poems come with little tiny stories. I guess I, I had gone into the story from... Uh, from lead, but there's so many fascinating characters in uh, in Olio that um, mm-hmm. I uh, let me see. How about um, I'm trying try and read one that I usually don't don't get into very much. Mm-hmm. There was you know a fascinating uh, a woman named her name was Wildfire. Mm-hmm. It, uh, that was her uh, Native American name. She's also known as Edmonia Lewis. She was a sculptor, mm-hmm. and she uh, she had to leave the United States and go to Rome at the age of about twenty to carve out, like literally, carve out her life as a sculptor. And mm-hmm. later became one of the, well, the highest paid visual art, black visual artist in the United States. Got uh, $50,000. Wow. For sculptures, you know, and did sculptures of, uh, of presidents and whatnot. And mm-hmm. was, you know, fascinating, fascinating person. Um, but here's one. Um, here's one from, uh, from, she did a uh, sculpture of uh, Hagar. Uh-huh. Ha- Hagar, I should say, uh, the figure from the from the Bible, mm-hmm. who was uh, impregnated Abraham, and then thrown out of the uh, thrown out of the house when uh, he got his wife pregnant. Right. So this is uh, Hagar in the wilderness. Okay. It's from the perspective of the actual sculpture. Mm. Edmonia Lewis, Marble, 1875. You can actually look this, this sculpture up online. Yes. And you can see it for yourself. And Okay, I sure will. Thank you. Yeah. Hagar in the wilderness. My God is the living God. God of the impertinent exile. An outcast who carved me into an outcast carved by sheer and stony will to wander the desert in search of deliverance the way a mother hunts for her wayward child. God of each eye fixed to heaven. God of the fallen water jug of all the hope a vessel holds before spilling to barren sand. God of flesh hewn from earth and hammered beneath a will immaculate with the power to bear life from the lifeless like a well in a wasteland. I made in the image of a God that knows flight but stays me rock still to tell a story ancient as slavery, old as the first time hands clasped together for mercy and parted to find only their own salty blessing of sweat. I have been touched by my God in my creation. I've known her caress of anointing callous across my face. I know the lyric of her pulse across these lips, and yes, I've kissed the fingertips of my dark and mortal God. She has shown me the truth behind each chiseled blow that's carved me into this life. The weight any woman might bear to stretch her mouth toward her one True God, her own beaten marble song. Wow, that's beautiful. And that was written from the perspective of the... Sculpture. Of the sculpture. Yes, yes. And I found Edmonia uh, Lewis's biography on the, one of the Smithsonian websites. It's fascinating. It really is. Her brother, it says her brother financed her schooling and yes. helped her go to Oberlin in 1859. Yes. 
<laughs> yes, <laughs> and she had a she had a terrible time there. I'm she sure was she accused, did. She was accused of poisoning. Uh, I think it was two white girls. Wow. And they and she was beaten half to death. Mm. I had to go to, go to a trial in which she was acquitted after uh, after after being defended by I think his name was John Langston Mercer who was was a uh, you know he, had, he did like a 4 hour defense of her in court it's crazy it's a fascinating story i couldn't really, i really honestly i you could do a whole book just on Monia Lewis just and and now I, and it. now i get what you were saying about Olio when you were and and even lead belly and you were like these pe- you know these subjects you can do a whole separate work on each of them. You really, you really could, and you know, I mean, the thing that 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 start, you know, a motivating factor becomes: why didn't I learn about this in grade school? Wow. Why didn't I learn about this in high school? Why, why am I just finding out these these histories? I mean, I feel like you know, so so, yeah, part of my impetus and part of what you know kept, kept me going was like, just just annoyance. <laughs> <laughs> at the at the fact that um, I had not you know hadn't really heard about these some of these people before. I mean, in in Olio, there's Blind Tom, there's Blind Boone, there's there's uh, uh, Sissy Reddit Jones. There's um, if you haven't heard these these names before, I mean, mm-hmm. I haven't. The, and, and what's fascinating, you mentioning Edmonia Lewis and her being such a prosperous sculptor, you know. Back in the day, I thought Elizabeth Catlett or Caitlett uh, was our mm-hmm. first, you know, female black uh, sculpture, oh, uh, yeah, sculpt, nah. you know, artist. Yeah. yeah, you could probably, you know, I, I hate giving giving ideas away. No, you, could you probably don't have do it, to. Do it. <laughs> no, I mean, but I'm it's, saying the only reason I'm gonna say it is because most, because ninety nine percent of the time, people don't do it which is a little frustrating in, in certain ways. But yeah. you could do a whole book just on visual artists out of the 19th century. That's true. You know, I mean, what, was, yeah. what were their conversations like? Did they correspond with, with each other? What would their imaginary correspondence look mm-hmm. like? You know, what, you know, ex- trying to exercise or make a real, like, human figure a, a black human figure against the backdrop of the of the powerful psychological warfare of, of minstrelsy. Mm. What does that What does that look like? Mm-hmm. What does that feel like to be doing that in the eighteen seventies, eighties, nineties? Right. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I don't know. Those Those are just questions I, I think about because these are, they're essentially the same issues that we're dealing with today. And that's what's yeah. so crazy about it. I'm looking at this, I'm listening to you and I'm going, oh yeah, you know, this had to have been recent or not that I'm assuming, but you just don't think it was, wait a minute, all the way back then? Mm-hmm. <laughs> We're talking 1800s, this woman was creating. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. and, and times have not changed in, in those regards. Mm-hmm. Um, it says she was uh, eventually accused of stealing art supplies, and then they didn't allow her to graduate. Yeah, so you know, man, it, it, it was, it was, it was just, you, you know, o- o- Oberlin has a really interesting history. It's it's known as a very liberal college, mm-hmm. and, and to be, uh, it was really one of the first to to admit black students, black, but it also, black people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a very difficult history when it comes to you know. Edmonia in particular. I think actually now there's actually a uh, there's a, a building or a room dedicated to uh, Edmonia Lewis at Oberlin College. So you know, mm-hmm. um, it's it's you know like I said, it's 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 these complicated uh, pictures. It's, it, we we like to think, for instance, we like to think because you're talking about really during the Nader's of mm-hmm. black white relations, but there's a kind of we also don't want to neglect the understanding that there was black joy at the same time. There was black creativity. There was black ingenuity. Sure. There was black productivity. You know, in it, spite of, in spite, in spite of, all of, of yeah, all of those, all mm-hmm. of the, all of these, uh, 
this conflict and struggle, you know? Yeah. So we need to, we need to go back and, and not just see it as a black and white, you know, for lack of better terms, mm-hmm. picture, but, it, but there's, there's grays and yellows and blues and oranges all up in there as well. You know? Certainly, certainly. Yeah. And so, uh, Tayemba, what do you have coming up? Uh, any books or, or projects or maybe another event uh, that we can uh, look forward to and support you with? I would say is, uh, I'm, I'm working with uh, some, some great individuals. Janice Lowe, who's an amazing musician, mm-hmm. who is taking some of the poems of uh, the McCoy twins and put them to music. And uh, we, have, we have performed some, some of them. Uh, and with uh, some fantastic performers. Uh, and also Yodon Israel, who is, uh, who is uh, now an editor at a major press, uh, who, is, uh, who is just an amazing uh, uh, individual who, who helped take part of Olio and make it into an audio book, which you can find wow. on, okay. uh, on Amazon. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we're we're trying to make Olio bring Olio to the stage in a kind of multi-genre kind of way. Wow! And so that's going to be an interesting project because I think mm-hmm. it's it's going to be beyond what you find in the book. It's going to take the, the it's going to be a different kind of experience. Um, that's that's one thing I'm working on. Uh, I'm also you know working on some writing. I have another historical project that's also related to the people in Olio, mm-hmm. which I'm, you know, I'm really keenly interested in. Sure. Um, so I don't want to say a whole lot about that. Oh right yeah, now, that's but, fine. Yeah, but totally. <laughs> and then, then of course, there's, uh, you know, Cave Canem. You know, any any kind of, you know, I would encourage people to come out and and just, you know, take, you know, take notice of or go to a Cave Canem program mm-hmm. and, and find out what's going on in, you know, in, in the world of literature, what's fresh, what's new, what's interesting, what's challenging. Because we have, you know, just amazing uh, poets to offer through that, through our programming. And uh, that, you know, with, with things just opening up, do you perceive that there will be some of those really great readings that Kaveh Kahnem is known for in the near future? Mm-hmm. Well, they're already happening, uh, for one. They're happening, uh, you know, virtually. Oh, virtually, um, right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And this uh, summer, we're having a, uh, a, our 25th reunion celebration in which the general public can, can come and attend many of that the That will programs. be in person? No, that will be oh, virtual as well. Virtual, okay. But, but that, means you can, that means you can attend... If you're if you're in Europe, if you're in Africa, if you're in, in in whatever part of the world you can you you are, you can attend if you have okay. uh, some internet uh, internet link. And so that will that is not just for fellows or members. That will be for mm-hmm. the public as well. Yes, there's okay. there's parts of it that are for for just fellows. Mm-hmm. The, so that's where we're we're staging it as a reunion. Mm-hmm. Uh, as well as a kind of overall celebration. But if there's also parts of it that are, that are open to the public June 13th through the 19th. Wow. Uh, and I encourage people to, to come on through and, uh, and, see, and just avail themselves of, of some of the joy and some, some of the, uh, the amazing things that, uh, that Kaveh Kahnem poets are doing, Black poets are doing in general. And, and the way that that uh, our 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 literature is being changed and challenged, and 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 our narratives are being reshaped by poetry. Wow, that's wonderful! And I'll be definitely looking uh, looking out uh, for the uh, the promos and the the different uh, listings uh, on that for for those public events. So thank you for sharing that. Absolutely. And My so, Taimba, this brings us to uh, the point where I want to ask, how can we follow you uh, on social media and, uh, you know, all of that? Where, where are you? Uh, where are you? Where are you? Located? <laughs> I, I am on I am on the Twitter machine <laughs> and I'm also on on the gram. 
I'm I'm new to the gram, so I'm okay. I'm not as as prolific on the gram. Okay. Uh, I uh, and I do do put put. I'm on Facebook as well, mm -hmm. but I I'm kind of uh, you can follow me on Facebook. Uh, so I'm on all all three of those uh, those social me social medias, um, and you know holler at me, you know let me know what's up, how you doing, and uh, I'll do my best to get back to you in a timely fashion. Wow, well that is fantastic. Taimba Jess, this has been a, quite a privilege to talk with you today and hear you uh, profoundly discuss your work. Um, and of course, I will continue to follow you and support uh, all the wonderful things you're doing. Congratulations on all of your success and on your 25th year anniversary with Kaveh Khanum. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And it's been real, real pleasure being on your on your podcast. I feel like I've uh, I've I've made it to the next level. I'm on your... <laughs> Yay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Thanks so much for that. Well, Tampa, I will be in touch and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Absolutely. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs> And you were just listening to episode 26 of Nerdocity Podcast in celebration of the last day of National Poetry Month, featuring my guest, award-winning poet, Taimba Jess. You can visit his website at taimbajess.net. I hope you'll check out Nerdocity Podcast and follow on Instagram at Nerdocity Podcast. Also tweet me and follow on Twitter at NerdocityPod1. Visit my author and artist site at doawaworld.com. And if you've been enjoying these episodes, feel free to give a small donation at paypal.me slash doawaworld or by visiting anchor.fm slash doawafraser slash support. Thanks again for listening. Take care. <laughs>